Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host, Scott Brady, and I'm here with my co-host, Matt Scott. Hello. And we have a very special guest today. In fact, I would say one of the individuals within the Overland community that was formative to its beginning. And his name is Mario Donovan. He is the CEO of AT Overland, formerly Adventure Trailers, who know that business name. And Mario, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's great to be here, guys. You you had to come dozens of feet to get here (laughs) exactly (laughs) yeah it was a whole 12 minutes (laughs) well that's kind of that's kind of a funny part of the story too is I mean let's go back to the beginning um we were at SEMA I think it was 2005 I think you're right maybe 2004 I think it was 2005 and I had my white Tacoma with a roof tent on it Mm -hmm. and about eight billion other things bolted to it and uh you guys were at AT, you know, Adventure Trailers was at the show and you guys reached out and you said, hey, we would love to just have lunch. I can't remember if we had lunch or maybe we had a late early dinner. Or we, we got together at, in a hotel lobby yep. um, of one of the hotels right by the convention center. And you guys said, first of all, like, who are, like, where did you come from? Yeah. Why are you stalking our website? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and then basically how do we work together? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and that was the start of us doing projects together, traveling together mm-hmm. and, you know, having again, many more meals together, talking about yeah. the world and culture and, the, and our joy of travel. And it has been such a pleasure to watch you and your business grow over that period of time. So it started you know, a long time ago, we're coming up on 20 years of knowing each other, which is pretty amazing. That, that is pretty amazing. And and you guys have grown too, and it's been fun to watch. Yeah, we, yeah we've all kind of been along, for, holding on, I guess, for yeah. this for this ride. I think we've all been paddling the same canoe together. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Maybe. Well, and so when we look at some of the big innovations from Adventure Trailers and AT Overland, you guys were one of the first to have a lightweight long travel independent suspension trailer manufactured in the United States That's that was right. being done in other countries. But you guys were certainly the first to really bring dial that in mm-hmm. for the North American market. Um, and I actually pulled your adventure trailers chaser number one, all the way up to the Arctic ocean. Uh, one of my first trips. So that was a, a big help for us. Yeah, that, that, was, that was epic. And it really was a game changer for you to do a solo vehicle uh, trip like that. Yeah. That's what made it a little different. And that trailer was awesome. And you guys sold squillions of those. And then of course the market responded and everybody starts making trailers. That's right. But the good thing is you've always been a couple steps ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that's the recurring theme. I yeah. think of, of Mario is kind of that, that skunk works of, of, of overlanding. You know, there's been so many trends that you've kind of helped to establish. I think so many within the industry really look to what you're doing. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. with the with the wedge campers being such a huge thing now. I mean, yeah. with the AT Habitat and AT Summit, like that was that was kind of genesis for that. And now it's like everybody and their brothers copied it. And you know, now you're doing a Terra, which is the like ne- the super step. cool. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Well, and it yeah the the thing that you guys did really well with the wedge camper. I mean, there was a flip pack before that, but they didn't take full advantage of the concept by having it flip out to the back, mm-hmm. which you guys yeah. did. And, and actually, Earth Roamer did that as well. Yes, But just did. for, a, I think they had 13 like, units or thir- something like that. 10 or 13, it wasn't yeah, very, very, yeah. very few urn- units. It's kind of funny that the X, XBJP or whatever, XVJP ended yeah. with unit number 13, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, yours came off the back and created an awning. So it just, and it was also much lighter and much more structurally rigid, mm-hmm. and it didn't have a lot of the cracking and torsion bar failures right. that the early flip, flip packs well, had. Don't forget, we originally started with the JK Habitat, yeah. which flipped forward yeah. and was pretty groundbreaking at the time. There was no nothing doubt. like that, and but the timing was wrong, and, yeah. the, and the market didn't take off, and I think we only made 
30 of those. Yeah. And then that's when we realized, like, the pickup truck market is These are, like, the cult products that I want now. Like, <laughs> oh, I, I yeah. want, like, a JK there's, Habitat. There's yeah. actually a Facebook group now for JK Habitats. Oh, interesting. So it could only be 30 members. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but well, it does exist. So how many of your wedge campers have you guys produced so far? That's a good question. I because it's three different models, and they, sure. they've kind of been tracking differently. Hundreds of them, I would suspect. I, I, I oh, see oh, them around quite that. a bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely over a thousand. Wow! Since 2016 was the very first uh, pickup truck uh, habitat that went on the X Overland. To yeah, on. that's they, right. And they're still running that truck. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, but yeah, there's yeah, well over a thousand are out there. Yeah, and I think the fact that it's structural aluminum that's extremely lightweight. You can paint it to match the vehicle. Yeah. I mean, it's just... It looks really, really good painted, if I do say so. Well, and so. you... <laughs> so, Matt, you've got one on your Gladiator. Yeah, I have, the, I have the first one made for the Gladiator. Yeah. And, I, I mean, I, I really like it. I mean... No, knowing about your vehicle, ADD, and how you go through vehicles... I'm about to register this car for the third time. I know. That's amazing. It's a miracle. I know. It's incredible. Every time I think about selling it, it's like, I, I just get this Mario image in my head just like yeah. <laughs> but i mean i i, I have beat the cra- I, I don't i don't drive i don't daily drive that gladiator mm-hmm. right i mean that gladiator has almost thirty thousand miles on it and that is just trips yep. mm-hmm. um and i mean that thing's it's been airborne accidentally and it's just like it's so solid that camper on the back mm-hmm. um and and it's really warm and quiet inside like that was the thing that i noticed Maybe the first time like we were in some campground in Mexico and there's like yapping dogs outside and I opened the door and I'm like, wow, it's a lot louder outside because we have that, you know, like that. Yeah, that you've got the liner pack. on yeah. the inside plus the honeycomb composite in the walls makes a huge difference. Well, and from my perspective, the thing that made it a game changer was the fact that up till that point, if you wanted to put a camper in a Tacoma, maybe you were lucky enough to get a flip pack. They were hard to get. A lot of people didn't know about them. Mm-hmm. They were fairly obscure product, yeah, long lead time. Mm-hmm. Um, so what most people would do is they'd either go with just a basic fiberglass shell and they'd sleep in it on a on plywood, or they would try to find a four-wheel camper. Mm-hmm. The problem for a Tacoma owner with a four-wheel camper is you slide in the camper, you now have no more payload. It can be you and your Chihuahua, and that's it. Like or Chihuippet, or Chihuippet. Yeah, exactly. Scott yeah, has a, a very small Chihuahua. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's just no payload in those trucks. Right. So when you guys started producing campers that are 350 to 500 pounds, approximately, oh, we've never hit 500 pounds. Our heaviest is 420 pounds. Okay, so in that range, yeah. that is very light, significantly mm-hmm. less yeah. than than a a slide in camper would be, and so for people who want to modify their trucks and add additional components and add additional water and additional fuel and bumpers, you've pretty much got to go with a wedge style camper on a Tacoma. Yeah, either a wedge style or if you go with a Habitat, which is flip over, it's a complete game changer. Yeah. Because you're going from a five foot bed Tacoma to now you have a 15 and a half foot long tent. Yeah. So I tripled that space. If I was to do it again, I would do the Habitat. I mean, I don't know. It's different. It's different. But now we have the dog. We have the large greyhound that could have his own bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, it, and you're right, and that's why you guys offer three of them. So the, yes. you have the wedge style, you have the habitat that flips all the way up and over, mm-hmm. and then you have your newest model, which is the Atlas. The Atlas, named after the, the god. Yep, the god holding up the earth. Mm-hmm. So it's it lifts straight up. It lifts straight up. Yeah, which is I think another very very interesting solution and it's most appropriate for certain vehicles Mm -hmm. you know if you've got a little bit like a quad cab truck those they seem to work really well for that yeah yeah and what what have you found in so you guys have always had an emphasis on lightweight and performance what what else have you found now or what changes in your perspective has occurred since you've been making all of these campers what's been the the takeaway from that that's an interesting question, and there could be a volume of answers for sure. that. Um, what we have noticed is that it's been this nice bridge for people between the rooftop tent and the slide-in camper, like you pointed out. Yeah. And hitting that sweet spot for weight to where you can still have enough GVW left 
to carry some gear sure has also been part of that sweet spot but what we've also noticed because when we started out we thought price point we want to keep this in a price point that is accessible to to the everyman and what we witnessed was that people want every accessory <laughs> available sure that we that we make to go on them so having just a base model go through the shop is a rarity interesting and was that a surprise for you in a way you were thinking that people would do more we base thought, models we thought that people would do more base models interesting and I, I think people in general are spending more. I mean, I don't know really what has changed if it's that people have been, you know, doing the Overland thing for longer. But, mm. you know, I, I remember when, you know, there was a handful of people who would have a new vehicle to go off road. Mm. And now it's a handful of people that don't. Yeah. You know, I think there's just more of money in the space. Like, I don't know if people just are happy to allocate more money because it's more of a, it's more of a thing or. Well, I think it's also an awareness of, of the activity, yeah, right, of vehicle-based remote travel. It, it, people are veering away from the standard RV model or the just go to the national forest and camp in the you know, standard campground. People want to be away from other people. It's not yeah, sure. like people, but they want to have a, more of a remote experience. And you can't do that with the more conventional options. So I think that's why we're seeing more and more people Embrace, pool. embrace that activity. And it's quite honestly has off to you. It has a lot to do with the internet, the forums like the expedition portal that have created that virtual community where people can learn about this. And then once they learn about it, they're hooked. Yeah, sure. And I would suspect that if you go to look at, at the cost of a slide in camper, you know, you're a slide in camper for a Tacoma, you're, mid to high 20s so and yeah. that you know that's with the goodies on it mm-hmm. um you're that's, that's a base model for for a decent one yeah not a it's it wouldn't be a tray model it would just be kind of a standard slide in you know it's got it's yeah. still got the sink and stuff but it's yeah. standard slide in whereas a habitat for example would be you know at 12 grand yeah so about half of that price it is that perfect bridge between the roof tent and, and something yeah, bigger. Yeah. Key differences, though, are yeah. that we're very purpose-built. Yeah. I mean, we're, we are building for the remote traveler. Yeah. We expect you to drive into a tree. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And so the product has been designed and manufactured that way. Sure. Whereas that's not where you would go with the standard slide-in. Yeah, yeah I think true. a slide-in definitely limits you quite a bit more. Um, like, I've never felt limited, really, by my by my summit, like you, you do notice, you know, a little bit of, you know, uh, there's more weight up top. Mm-hmm. You notice that, you mm-hmm. know, that's just a fact of life, but it's not limiting. Like it's tucked in. It's the width of the cab of the vehicle. It's, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's been an interesting thing for me. Well, I think, I think the difference between the slide in and the topper is the topper is in some respects a little bit like how our trailers used to be where, you live around them, sure. Not necessarily in them. You're, sure. you're really only in them to sleep or for shelter in extreme conditions. Yeah. Whereas the sliding camper tries to replicate more the mini apartment. Yeah. And mini so, sailboat inside kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're more inclined to live in the inside of one of those than around. Yeah, for sure. All right, so then the next evolution, mm. you guys, you worked with Dave Souza from yeah. Turn Overland mm-hmm. to help create the Aterra. Yeah. So what what inspired you guys to decide that you wanted to create your own expedition camper, fully contained expedition camper? Um, that was driven by what we had seen being the deficiencies in other products that were in the market. Um. There's a lot of storage shortcomings, and our market, like the pure overlander, the the aspirational trip is I quit my job, and I'm living in my truck, and I'm driving around the world. Sure. That's the aspirational thing. The typical sliding camper really is not suitable for that. And... The typical sliding camper is not using the best available technologies 
to manage that home on wheels infrastructure. And they're typically pretty heavy. So focuses were on weight, the quality of the technology that's inside of that, and the amount of storage that you have. Practical storage. Like, can I pack clothes for four seasons? Sure. And so is there enough storage to do that? Have my recovery gear for when I am doing fun, dangerous stuff, and all the other things that you need to get through life. Some of the people that we have built trucks like this for uh, run the gamut. Um, we have one client, he's a remote doctor. So he's out in the field, he needs tons of water, but he needs a safe place, regardless of the weather, that has all of his gear that he can still you know, run his practice. Wow. And you can't do that in a sliding camper. Right. And you can't even do that in a topper. You need a more complete system. So if you look at how we designed the Atera and how we created the technology on the inside, there are very few option boxes for you to check off because we just included everything that we know you're going to need mm. for that true full-time environment. Well, and, and again, coming back to that takeaway that you had with the, with the toppers is that mm. people tend to buy them fairly well modified. I mean, fairly oh, yeah. complete. Mm -hmm. So you kind of knew that going into Aterra, so that was an advantage for you for right. sure. Right, yeah. We had, what, six years experience selling a, another brand. And yeah, sure. seeing how people were purchasing and what they wanted from us. Sure. You know, since we also offer, you know, all the equipment for the vehicles on, on site, they can come to us and it's, it's turnkey. Turnkey. They don't have to go to four different shops to get stuff done. Well, congratulations on all the products that you have brought to market and their success in the market as well. They've, I've just never heard anyone say, you know, I just don't like this mm -hmm. AT product. There may be that they've got small issues here and there like any product would, but I've just never heard anybody have some catastrophic failure with it. So no, yeah, <laughs> which that's how you build them. Right. Yeah. Well, we're all, everybody under our roof is an aficionado. So, all of that thought process comes from the entire team and how do we get to this product? How do we solve these problems and make something that we don't have to apologize for? Sure. And uh, it's been a successful method. Yeah, no question. It's been amazing to watch. Any other questions that you've got on? What's the weight on the Ateran? Like what, what's like the, the published? The published figure? weight is 1,250 pounds. Um, we have made some generational changes managed to shave another 70 out wow yeah yeah that that alone is exceptional it is yeah it truly is yeah that's amazing so you i mean it puts it on a 2500 ram oh, easily easily yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah with a coil sprung rear suspension. yeah that, that's the benefit don't tempt me <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah you just happen to have one of those hanging around matt yeah. it's kind of like an apartment on a buggy yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could you imagine Prospector with one of those on top? That'd be pretty amazing. I'll have to suffice with the Earth Roamer for now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, darn. Oh, so darn. Stay tuned. We're kind of working on something like that. Cool. Um, man. I don't know. That sounds pretty rad. So I think it would be fun, Mario, because those that are listening, Mario has had an extremely colorful life, and I think that that's part of – the joy of knowing you, Mario, and it, I think it explains a lot of why you are the way you are and why you build things the way that you do. But I just remember one of the first stories that you told me was that you left um, Ethiopia as a young man um, very quickly because a tank ran into your apartment. Yeah. So I think we start with the tank story, and then let's go, let's, like, how did you end up in Ethiopia? Let's, after that, let's get into how did you end up in Ethiopia to begin with? Okay. Well, the tank story is kind of interesting. I'd already graduated from high school, and uh, was still hanging around in Addis Ababa. Uh, during that time, we had martial law. Uh, there was a revolution going on, and there was infighting between the various groups in the military to grasp power from... 3,000 years of monarchy or... Sure. And so curfew ran from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And that means nobody out on the streets, you know. And uh, I was living in a 
It was a three-story apartment building on Churchill Road in Addis Ababa. And the bottom floor had uh, two shops. One was a tailor shop and one was a coffee shop. And as you know, in the third world, not uncommon for the store owner to actually be living in the store. Sure. Um, so I think, I don't know, maybe it was 5 a.m.-ish. It was definitely still curfew hours. And just the whole building just shudders. Boom. And uh, it, there had been a lot of gunfire in the city and, you know, rounds coming through apartment windows and stuff like that, stray rounds. So I uh, went out to the balcony and crawled across the balcony, and I, I looked out onto the street, and uh, there was the uh, the rear end of a, I guess it was a tank or an armored personnel carrier sticking out of the coffee shop down, <laughs> downstairs. <laughs> and uh, so I, what we surmised happened that day was – um, that the owners of the coffee shop uh, were either from Tigray or Eritrea, and uh, there had been an, a long-standing fight for freedom by that province from Ethiopia. So they probably were viewed as maybe instigators or part of you know the other side, and so they basically annihilated whoever was in there, and that that. Probably was like a Sunday or a Monday. <laughs> and uh, by Wednesday, uh, I had a flight out of Addis Ababa. <laughs> and that was not easy to do because it was hard to get a flight. There was, you know, it was risky to get across town and things like that. And that was in, uh, that was February of 1977. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So I left there and uh, flew from there to Aden, then to uh, Bombay at the time, and then to Bangkok, and then to Manila, and then finally back to the U.S. And I visited friends all along the route. Oh, cool. Uh, school chums. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so how, how did you end up in Ethiopia to begin with? <laughs> you don't get to pick your parents. Um, my, my mother uh, worked as a consultant for the United Nations. And she would be on loan as a publication specialist uh, to different organizations that were doing scientific research. So in one case, it was uh, insect physiology. So they were studying insects that carry encephalitis, uh, malaria, um, and other diseases. So primarily, they were studying locusts, uh, mosquitoes, and sudsy flies. And then in another case, it was um, an organization that's st- that was doing crossbreeding of cattle. So there's a, a cattle strain in Africa called the zebu, and it's very disease resistant, but it doesn't produce a lot of milk or a lot of meat. And so they were trying to crossbreed some European breeds to produce a higher yield, but more disease resistant cattle. So there's all these different types of development programs. Um, she did a stint with the Ethiopian Ministry of Tourism for a while, and this was during the Haile Selassie days before the revolution, uh, helping them develop uh, their uh, publication programs for advertising tourism around the world. Sure. Yeah. Um, so just a lot of interesting organizations like that. But because she was so busy, she just plunked me in a boarding school. And uh, so she thought it would be cool to put me in a boarding school where I didn't speak the language. She put me into a French lycée. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. from, from day one, it was, uh, you better learn how to speak French, kid, or you're going to go hungry. And wow. <laughs> It, it Did you learn how to speak French? Oh, yeah, I'm fluent in French. Amazing. Yeah. But it was interesting because up to that point in my life, and that was when I was 10 years old when that occurred, um, we had moved 14 times by the time I was 10. Wow. So I had become very used to this nomadic lifestyle of just having a couple of suitcases and moving from one place to the other. So moving to Africa was like, we go again we're moving again um but it was interesting dropping into ethiopia because keep in mind i grew up in a small town that when i was there was about 250 residents uh it's a small town called bolinas california and the latest census it's 1600 (laughs) okay so so it's grown a bit right but i went from 250 people to a city, Addis Ababa at that time had about 700,000 in population. So not only was it, oh my God, there's a lot of people here, 
but they all speak languages I don't understand. Sure. And they eat food I've never seen before. And, and they so, eat it in ways you've never seen before. Exactly, right? And, yeah, you, you eat with your hands. And so I had my own culture shock. It would almost be like someone coming from Ethiopia coming to the U.S., like going into New York City and going, holy smokes, this place yeah. is huge, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had, like, the reverse experience. Uh, and then when I left Ethiopia, um, I moved to Los Angeles. And yeah. that was, yet again, another cultural experience. No question. I remember being picked up at the mm. airport and being taken to where, where I lived for a while in Pasadena, California, and just thinking my first thought was like, oh, my God, it's so far from one place to another. <laughs> yeah. And literally day two on the ground in Los Angeles, I went out and I bought a motorcycle. That was the first thing I did. Well, and if I remember, you learned to ride a motorcycle in Africa. Is that right? Oh, yeah. So you got to tell that story. Like, it, like <laughs> didn't you like steal them? Like, something happened. You stole a motorcycle. Yes, or absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, at the time I was living in Nairobi and uh, uh, we lived in a, I think it was a three unit flat. And uh, one of our neighbors was a, a, a German and he was part of a German aid organization. And he was actually teaching auto mechanics uh, at some polytechnic school in Nairobi. And he had uh, a Honda 175 twin in his garage that he barely rode, but he was always gone. And I, I wasn't even thinking about girls at the age of 15 or 16. All I could think about was motorcycles. I just thought they were the best. Cheaper. Cheaper. <laughs> yeah, cheaper than girls. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I figured out how to hotwire it. Oh, that's and awesome. Yeah, the key was simple. It was underneath the tank. You just put a little wire across it, and then I would... I would unscrew the odometer. I'd look, check, see how much fuel was in the tank, and then I'd ride it around the neighborhoods in Nairobi <laughs> and then fill it back up with gas, put it back in the garage, <laughs> take my little wire off, and then screw the odometer cable back in. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, when I came of age to drive, about a year later, um, my mom said, so, you know, what do you want to drive? And I uh, said, I'd really like a motorcycle, like that guy. So I forget what his name was, Hans or something. Sure. And uh, she said, oh, I, I talked to him. He's got it for sale. So I actually bought it. <laughs> <laughs> so I absolved myself of that guilt. Right? <laughs> for and, sure. And, 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 you know, and do you need to test ride it? Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> it looks great. So, yeah, that was my first motorcycle. He's like, he's like, I don't know why it needs new tires. He's like, I've only, <laughs> only put 300 miles on it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and been in love with motorcycles ever since. Best uh, way you can travel. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I was fortunate enough to be able to ride around Ethiopia and Kenya on a motorcycle solo. It was a great way to get out into the backcountry. And with fuel being as expensive as it was and hard to get, it was a really good way to get around. Yeah, I suspect. Yeah. Amazing. What question you got next? Man, I don't know. The stories are so good. The stories are super great. I mean, so I guess we've never really talked much about, you know, your adventures in Ethiopia, you know, outside of Addis Ababa. Mm. Like, what are, the, what are some of the places that you would recommend that travelers go? In Ethiopia? Yeah. Man, you can't go wrong. Um it is such an interesting country geographically and culturally. Keep in mind, it was never colonized, so it has its unique personality with a little bit of an Italian influence because the Italians made a, a short attempt at, yeah. at colonizing. And you didn't think it had turned World War II? It was like one of Mussolini's big things. Yeah, Mussolini kind of was like, well, everybody else is doing it. I should get a piece <laughs> of action. And, sure. And then he got, got his butt kicked by the Ethiopians. Consequently, there's good wine. And good pasta hmm. in Ethiopia, uh, but it might be spicy. Okay, <laughs> I've only had Ethiopian food once, and that was with you. Yeah. No. No. Wait, I've been to Ethiopia. <laughs> the airport. <laughs> oh, you went to you were at the Bole Airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It in, was in very, Addis or in Addis. It was very. Um, well, they're building a new airport, so you could tell it was at the 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 last of its legs. I have learned that every airport in the world perpetually under construction yeah that's true yeah yeah pretty much yeah. it's just the mo i cannot recommend eating ethiopian food on an airplane it is quite messy <laughs> well and why is why is ethiopian food messy 
you, I remember I was going to go out to an Ethiopian. I asked you about the Ethiopian right? food in yeah. Las Vegas, and you, or it was, it was maybe in Denver, and you said, here's the place. You got to go here. Yeah. And you're like, but here's the deal. And you, you talk about why it's messy, and then you told me about Tej. Oh, Tej. Yeah. Yeah, so you got yeah. to let everybody know, why is it messy to eat Ethiopian food, and what is Tej? Yeah. Talk food to me. <laughs> so... Well, Ethiopian food is messy if you don't have practice. Yeah. Right? So, like, like anything. Yeah. So if an American's trying to eat Ethiopian Hi, food. I'm from sure. Chicago. <laughs> yeah, yes. Exactly. All right. This is going to be a disaster. Put, put this bib on. <laughs> this, is a, this is a pizza with a knife and a fork. <laughs> yeah. So Ethiopian food, the, the, uh, the, the core bread is called injera, and injera is made from a fermented teff flour. And so it has a kind of a moist, spongy texture to it. Um, but you tear it off with, with your right hand, not your left hand. And, uh, and you use a piece of that to grab a, a piece of meat from the stew or a potato or collard greens or whatever it is, and then you plunk that in your mouth. And they serve all those dishes on top of the injera. So the best part of the meal is actually the base layer of injera that soaked up all those yummy sauces. Yeah, and, sure. Um, tej is a mead that Ethiopia... I- as I knew it for a long time, was one of the largest producers of honey in the world. Wow. And doesn't export a drop of it because they make Tej with it. And so Tej is this beer level in alcohol, a little less than wine. It's usually, you know, 8%. Is that the stuff there. that we had that was like homemade? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And it's always going to be homemade because if you're buying it out of a bottle from a big, brewery it's not any good <laughs> yeah so in ethiopia you would go to some place called a tej bet and a tej bet bet means house so it's a tej house and so basically that's nomenclature for a bar but they also serve food and every single one of those places has their own unique tej flavor and it's because the yeasts come out of the air and the yeast comes from a little uh branch which is a relative of the bitterroot bush it's called Geshel. If you go into an Ethiopian, mar- Ethiopian market in the U.S., usually it'd just be like a bag and it'll say sticks on it. Because you, know, <laughs> you don't know, but they know. <laughs> they know what it is. <laughs> but they just call it sticks. If you're lucky, they might call it Geshel. But uh, that's how they make Tej. It's really simple. But it's, it's so complimentary to the meal because it has sweetness and it helps offset that spiciness. And, and you know... Drinking yeah. and eating together and the bread almost is, is a little sour, so you kind of get that yeah, sweet, so, sour. Yeah, that's spicy, the fermented aspect yeah. of, the, of the of the uh, injera. Yeah. Okay, so since edge is so easy to make, you got to let the listener know how do you make edge. Like, yeah. what's the process? You get some really good honey. Okay, honey. Get a bag of sticks. Bag of sticks. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Uh, water, maybe. Water. Patience. Oh, that's it. Yeah. And then you let the the sugar in the honey ferment. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I That's recently cool. learned that honey never expires. This is true. And they have found honey in the pyramids. Hmm. And per- you can still eat it. Perfectly edible. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah, bees cool. are amazing. Yeah. Bees, bees yeah. make the world go yeah. round. Yeah. We need yeah. more don't, bees. Let's, let's not don't miss. kill bees. Yeah, don't kill the bees, please. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Well, that is that is so amazing. And I have noticed that's one of the things I've always enjoyed in our conversations is that you you light up about things in cultures that not a lot of people think about. Like everybody wants to have good coffee. You know, if you go to Turkey, you're going to have a Turkish coffee and it's going to taste a certain way. But what I have found with you is that I'll ask you about Ethiopian coffee and you'll go down to like telling me how they pick the beans and like, (laughs) and what the roasting process is like over the fire and this, and you even knew the name of the pan and everything. Where where did this curiosity come for, for like, for food and drink and like those nuances of culture that maybe not a lot of people think about? Um, Well, first of all, I like to eat and I like yummy stuff. But also, food and breaking bread, having a meal together, um, sitting here, drinking fizzy beverages together. uh, As Overlanders do. Yes, as Overlanders do. (laughs) My wallet comes from Italy. (laughs) (laughs) But breaking bread is a very social thing, right? If you eat together as a family or if you eat with friends. And it is the 
the basest form of true brotherly love. Yeah. If I am willing to share my bounty from my farm or from my hearth with you as the traveler or the visitor, I'm expressing love to you, yeah. sharing that with you. And we've taken everything else out of the equation. Our religions, our political you know, thoughts or anything. It's about the meal. Yeah. And so there's that base thing about food that I love so much. And then food becomes the conversation point. Mm. And food is so interesting all over the world. But then you also find similarities. I find that part of it interesting. Like almost every culture has their form of a sandwich. <laughs> it's sure. some sort of a grain with a filling. Yeah. yeah. Whether it's injera and the wat that you would use and, and have in it, or the pita bread falafel, sure. or you know the deep dish pizza in Chicago. Yeah. There's some form of a sandwich. And I find that interesting, that we have these commonalities, even though we are so different from each other. I even found a sandwich in Mexico. Well, they just use wit. They just use well. That's different. Yeah, that that's that's a good example of a sandwich. Yeah. I didn't think of that one. But they actually have <laughs> they actually have like bread sandwiches in Mexico with like way too much mayo on it. Mm -hmm. So it's like I guess when you've perfected food with a taco. In America, we have Le Big Mac. <laughs> yeah, I said we. Yeah, we do have. Actually, I think that we invented the Reuben sandwich. Not I think we invented the Reuben sandwich. Yeah, the Reuben's pretty good sandwich. Yeah, yeah that is a pretty we, good. sandwich. We invented that. Yeah. Look like, it up. Like, who's we? <laughs> I did. Oh. In the 1920s. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Oh. yeah. In your I'm former actually, life as a I'm Jewish actually, deli owner? I'm actually a time traveler. <laughs> I just decided to, you know, decided to come to the... That's how you pick all these cars so well. Yeah. You, you knew. You something fascinating <laughs> about you every time we talk. <laughs> yeah. You came back from the future with an NADA... You know, future cars value handbook. Exactly. That's that's like how exactly. he picks and buys cars. <laughs> uh, okay, so you end up you end up in Los Angeles, and you've had all of these incredible experiences in boarding schools and traveling around the world. Um, a very a very dynamic mother that was an, an intellectual and deeply engaged with the UN, a, a worldly organization. Mm -hmm. How do you think that that changed you? I mean, you're when, even when I first met you, you're you're not. A typical person. It's like you've had an, you've had a lot of a lot of very it's a really unique. nice way of saying he's a weirdo. <laughs> well, but like somehow not weird, not weirdo. but somehow not weird, right? Yeah. So like to have all those really unusual experiences and, and upbringings and not be weird, that's kind of hard to do. Mm. How, did you, well, I think how did you do that? Yeah, I mean, I think like some could perceive it as being weird, but it's it's. I've always looked at Mario as being very international. Sure, mm. you know, very international, very cultured, very open to different ideas. Um, yeah. You know, when you see that in all kind of, you know, ways in Mario's life, I think mm. whether that's business, personally, or um, I don't know. But well, how did that bring about that openness, that open-mindedness, that curiosity? Help us understand that process that, that happened for you. My, my mother had a big role in forming that thought process for me. She used to drill this thing into me. It's a French saying, noblesse oblige. And it basically, it means no matter what your station is in life, you never look down on someone. Mm -hmm. There is always something to learn from everyone. And in order to do that, in order to learn, you have to have an open mind. You have to be willing to have your beliefs turned on their head. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you think about our standard American culture as we, as we know it, and you were to go overseas, you would think things are weird. Yeah. yeah. Guess what? They think things are weird about you too. Yeah. And so when you go into situations around the world like that, you are going to have a much richer experience if you just let things happen. Um, I know we talked about your Silk Road experiences and armpit cheese and things like that. Yeah. Hello, that's what the world is like. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and that experience for you was a reflection of incredible generosity by those people. No question, yeah. Right? Regardless of borders and beliefs, yep. that happened. And you don't experience that unless you're open-minded. Mm. And so I think if you aren't, you're going to miss a lot of stuff. I think also having those experiences helps develop tolerance. Yeah. 
for you. And with tolerance comes patience and compassion, compassion yeah. and all those things that make you a better human being, in my opinion. Yeah. Maybe dampens our it's, ego it's a little so bit if we're lucky. It's so easy to isolate yourself these days when you travel. I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you can you can get off of your bed on the plane to your car to your hotel to your Uber to your this and mm -hmm. miss the entire experience and the point of why you went there. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's why you're way better off hot wire in the motorcycle. Better adventures. <laughs> I think that's one of the, I, that's one of the things that you know attracts me to traveling, you know, by motorcycle, particularly in Africa. Um, you know, because you're just more in it. You know, you. Yeah, motorcycling is, I mean, you're totally in it, right? Yeah. You're you're feeling every temperature change. You're tasting every bug, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, it's, and you're more physically involved when you're riding a motorcycle. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're weaving a motorcycle through a, a local market, you know, in East Africa, you're actively involved. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're, you're not texting on your phone. You know what I'm saying? You got to be paying attention. And I think that is a nice upside of motorcycles. You disconnect a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, well, Motorcycles interest me so much for the cultural aspect of travel. I've never, to be honest, I, I, riding motorcycles in the U.S. is fun for sport. That's why we do, like, the trials and the enduro kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, like, blasting down I-70 on a on a 1200 GS. Just Bark a lounger on wheels. Just <laughs> might as well be in a car. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I... I don't know. I, as the world emerges from COVID, you know, this idea of motorcycle travel just really, really kind of inspires me. Well, yeah, absolutely. If there's the, a purity to it. Half the world purity gets around it, yeah. 125 cc's. No yeah. question. So you you have to talk about motorcycles just a little bit longer. Yeah. You have have you have had some wild motorcycles. If I remember, you had something that was already fast, and then you like you put a turbo on it. Yeah. So like what, what happened with that? <laughs> so there were two years, I think it was 84 and 85, Yamaha made a 650 turbo. And it had, because it would suck through fuel so fast when it opened up on boost, the carburetors were pressurized and there was a fuel pump to fill them up. And mm. almost every motorcycle prior to that had been gravity flowing yeah, through sure. the tank, right? And uh, it had a little Hitachi blower on it. And... Uh, <laughs> that was fun, uh, but it's even more fun if you put two of them on there and you put in a manual wastegate. <laughs> so, so yeah, and and it was an unfortunate time because I think we had the 55-mile-an-hour speed limit in the U.S. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, the whole gas and that does, bring up, that does bring up another story you told me about, something about, I don't know, some excessive speed... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you want to tell that story to the sure, listeners. Sure. It was an interesting ticket. Uh, <laughs> so I, I used to work at a printing plant, and I, uh, I was working, I think, starting at 6 a.m. or something like that. And uh, yeah, I was on the road. It was in, I think it was February, because I remember it was cold. It was really cold. I had a neoprene face mask on underneath the helmet and everything. And uh, I'm going down the highway, and there's nobody on the highway like at 4 a.m. So I'm cruising along. It's like 70, about, you know, above above the speed limit 70 above the speed no, no, limit. No, 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 it wasn't 70 <laughs> above at that moment. But, uh, uh, I looked in the rear view mirror and I could see this one light slowly coming up on me, maybe making about 10 miles an hour more than I was going. And as it's getting closer, I look in the rear view mirror and it's like, I'm look, trying to make out the, you know, the, the, the front lights on it. Yeah. I'm the thinking, mirrors rattling from the yeah, bike. Yeah. And I'm thinking, man, I wonder, is that one of those new Suzuki Katanas? I can't quite tell. And, uh, right when it got into my blind, blind spot, I shifted down two gears, clicked the wastegate, opened up the throttle, and took off. <laughs> yeah. And then the next time I looked in the mirror, way back there, was this red and blue flashing <laughs> lights. I'm like, damn. So through my, through my thought process, is like, do I just keep going? No, there's a highway patrol station coming up, you know, like two exits down. Now, this is not going to end well. So I just killed it, pulled off to the side. And the officer pulled up, and he was riding Harley. Well, back in those days, they were all on Kawasaki's, and the Y didn't recognize the light pattern. Sure. Front. So uh, he walked up to me, and, you know, the usual stupid question, you know, why I pulled you over. <laughs> like, well, yeah. <laughs> may have had something to Maybe. do with the facts. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, it was kind of funny. He, uh, he said, so uh, uh, like, 
do you know how fast you're going? And I'm like, the speedometer only goes to 85. And he says, I know you were going well over that. I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure I was. And uh, he said, okay, well, 85, we'll call it good. <laughs> and then the additional note was uh, something like, uh, engagement in speed with a police officer, a <laughs> speed contest with a police officer. That was on. on the oh, table. no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but fortunately, back back then, they didn't have, like, you know, these computer systems that spoke county to county and sure. all of that. So <laughs> you could rack up a, a couple of tickets in Los Angeles County in the morning, and then it got a couple of tickets down in Orange County or San Diego, and they'd be none the wiser, <laughs> even though you had, like, a three-ticket limit for the year. So it took a while to catch up with you. Yeah, you've definitely had some fun motorcycles. And what, what motorcycles do you have right now? Right now, I've got uh, an XL650, the the one that Expo had for a while. Yeah, yeah. And uh, still loving that bike, still riding it and throwing it down every now and then. And then uh, my my mistress is my 94 uh, Ducati Monster. That is, That's the first year for the Monster, right? 93 was. 93, okay. But um, it is a fun bike. It's It's had a lot of work done to it. It's really fast. It's cool. It's so raw. I like it because there's there's nothing but you controlling it. Mm. There's no ABS. There's no mapping. There's no selectable modes. Yeah. None of that. And uh, I like the rawness of coming into a corner hard and fast and just knowing that this might work or it might not. <laughs> And, uh, if it doesn't, I probably won't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, probably, it won't matter anyways. Yeah, it won't matter anyways. It, for, it forces you to ride. And, yeah. and, and the XL is like that, too. It's sure. Got nothing. It's totally analog. It's totally analog. Still huh? carbureted. Yep. Yeah, and, and not having some computer monitor that for me uh, just completely detaches me from the rest of the world and forces me to focus on just the riding. Yeah. It's it, a nice shot. And off. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good disconnect. Now, those are two great, could not be more po polar opposite motorcycles, but perfect. Absolutely. Totally perfect. Yeah, they look ridiculous next week. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. This content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. You talked about printing presses, and yeah. we've got to bring this up in the podcast because everybody needs to know, again, how material Mario was in many things. But Both of our businesses. Yeah, exactly. So we, we, uh, we decided in 2006 this crazy idea that we were going to start printing a magazine. So we had been running Expedition Portal for a while, and we decided we we're going to do this thing called Overland Journal. And uh, fortunately, we had Jonathan Hansen involved, incredible editor, and we had Stephanie, who incredible designer. Me, I don't know what I did that was all that useful, but we needed to figure out how to print this thing. So, and I'm like, I think Mario was in printing, or maybe you were still even in printing at the time. I can't remember. You were maybe making a transition. And and I said, we want to print this magazine. And what I loved about it, this is one of the things that stands out in my memory, is that you didn't tell me that that was a bad idea. You didn't, because it probably wasn't such a great idea. Like you were so enthusiastic and mm -hmm. you actually just sat down and says, well, let's figure out how we're going to do it. Because we knew what we wanted it to look like. And yeah. there's a huge gap between having a vision of what a magazine is going to look like in your hands mm -hmm. and printing it like yeah. the specification and the type of paper. 
And one of the outcomes from it that I think I'm most proud of, and it's directly re- as a result of your recommendation, is the whiteness of the paper that we use and the way that it makes the photographs look on the mm-hmm. paper. So thank you, Mario, for helping us to not only specify how we print it, but then you also helped us like, beat on the printer a whole bunch when they were doing stuff wrong. Yeah, yeah. It was a real pleasure. And I, I seem to recall that you may not have even known the level of my experience in the printing industry, but the magazine area was my specialty. Yeah, and, and it showed. Yeah, and I remember at the time you said you wanted to emulate the Surfer's Journal. That's right. That was sort of your... That, Our high, that, that high water your, mark. Yeah, yeah, that was your benchmark. And I remember looking at it and asking you, like, well, what do you think your publication numbers are going to be? And I told you, like, yeah, it's the wrong machine. Yeah. And we we repositioned a few things. Changed, you did. Changed the size a little bit. Yep. And then that got you to fit on the right machine for what you were doing. Yep. And you recommended Hudson, Hudson Printing out of Utah, out of, out which, of we st- which we still use. Yep. Uh, they've been an amazing partner, and now it runs on a much bigger machine. But right. because of your help, we were able to do all that. So thank you for that, Mario. Just oh. wanted to put that out there to everybody, that the reason why Overland Journal looks the way that it does in print is in large part because of of Mario's help. So well, You're welcome. And in case you need to know, I still scrutinize every issue that comes to the office with my loop to make sure that your printer is still doing the right thing. How are they doing? They're doing just Oh, right. that's good. I, that's I think you got them trained. That's we have, yeah, we've been we've been working on them for so long. Um, so now we've talked about motorcycles. Yeah. I think let's shift over to the four-wheel drives. Yeah. I don't know. What do you what, How many prospectors do you have right now? Like 8? No. No. no, no. I'm 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 down to 2. Just down to 2 trying to control myself so favorite vehicle my f- favorite vehicle i would have to say is uh prospector xl number one mm. that i bought from dave harrington yeah that's the the regular cab manual regular transmission cab. regular cab manual transmission coil yep. sprung in the back that is um it's a Jeep on steroids. Yep. It's what every Jeep wants to be when it grows up. <laughs> totally. I agree. I now see what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> that truck is so capable, unstoppable. It's just so much fun to drive. There's nothing like, as you know, rowing your own gears. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, the motor's detuned because of the manual. It doesn't matter. No, and, it's wonderful. And we, that, we actually use that as our shop truck probably the nicest parts getter in town but we still wheel it too yeah and uh well whenever you get ready to sell that one i still regret not buying it from dave when he called me up yeah that ain't happening (laughs) well maybe you never know just give it six months and i'll have a prospector for you (laughs) yeah that's right yeah matt yeah matt's got a prospector right now yeah but it won't be a six-speed yeah that's right it's the man say prototype on the inside door jam it was it was definitely the manual that that won me out on that one for sure. I'll, I'll have to give kudos to Dave. He really inspired us to take a good hard look at full size trucks um, when we realized the capabilities and had the opportunity to first drive them yeah. uh, in technical terrain and go, oh yeah, this this is it, and this is where we need to go for the the overloaders of the world. Yep. And uh, it made a, a shift for us at AT to start driving people in that direction, particularly for um, the people who want to do global travel and, yeah. and weight is a concern and, yeah. and power and range. Right. So I mean, yeah, the full size trucks just do everything so thing, much better. You know, every, and, and you hear this less and less where everybody used to want 10 years ago, 70 series, 70 series, 70 series, when we actually got something better here. Oh, yeah. Nobody really recognized it. Oh, sure. Um, and I think the thing with Overland Travel, too, is it's not generally incredibly technical, but no. all vehicles have become so much more capable. Yes. You know? Um, you know, uh, Gladiator versus, versus Prospector XL, right? I mean, the Gladiator is mm-hmm. still a little bit more capable, a little bit more nimble. Yeah. But by nature of being able to fit a 40-inch tire on something, while it's not... A 40-inch tire is not needed to drive around the world. Like, let's just get that out of the way. Yeah, true. 
but it just changes the dynamic of the vehicle and everything on that truck can support it. Yeah. You're not talking about swapping axles and this and that and whatever. Yeah, you don't even really need to change the gears, I don't think. I mean, you can get it from the factory with 410s or 456s or three, three whatever. 373s on the new ones, but... Yeah, um, yeah 410 still an option. We're still doing that. On and, the and 3500, doing, yeah. Yeah, well, we, we mostly deal in, yeah. the, in the cab chassis, you know, order from the factory scenario. Sure. So you have a lot more options when you go that route. Yeah. The thing that, that uh, is a real game changer from a uh, technical terrain perspective is the ratio of weight to square inches of contact patch of rubber. Mm-hmm. That is significant. Yeah. That is yeah, huge. They just, they just don't ever feel overloaded in a lot of no. scenarios. You know, I mean, I've, I've been on the trail with, you know, Tacomas that have like an XP camper, and they just struggle because nothing on that truck is meant to ever do that. Now, well, we see a lot of mid-sized trucks, you know, pushing the 6,500, 7,000-pound range, right? Yeah. Sure. And, uh, you know, my truck I pulled up in here the, with an Aterra on it, and it's 3,500, weighs 10,800 pounds. Yeah. And it's on a 41-inch tall tire. Yeah. So it's a big deal. 14 and a half inches wide. Yeah. So there's, you know, it's tenacious. It's yeah. tenacious yeah. on the road. It's tenacious on the trail. Yeah. So yeah. what is what was your favorite vehicle of all time i mean you had a comanche for about 87 i remember years. the comanche for like, i think you had it for at least where is that thing eight now? decades so so yeah <laughs> almost eight decades uh i had it for 20 years okay i bought it in 92 new off the dealer's lot and uh i sold it 20 years later for 500 dollars more than i paid for it but it probably had like four <laughs> times that much invested in it over, sure. over the period of time <laughs> But um, I sold it with 472,000 miles on it and the original transmission. That's incredible. Yeah. And it, to answer your question, it's uh, living a happy life in Maryland. Oh, okay. Yeah. But that vehicle, it was an interesting test bed for AT to test all of these different ideas in, yeah. the, in the midsize platform. And it was not a common truck. And so, so it always stood out. So it always stood out and always attracted attention. Um, and everything we did to it seemed like we were always the first person to, to do something like that. And we were horrifically overweight with that truck. I think we were maybe 800 pounds over GVW. And sure. And that truck got used in the safari triathlon races and just all this other stuff. And it, it had a rough life. It had a lot of repair work done. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you and – you, you just always did such a nice job with it. It was always such a cool vehicle, and I was su- I was actually surprised when you sold it. But I can see in hindsight now that like these these Rams really are just a much better choice for you and what you how you, you currently had a, you travel. You had a pit stop with uh, JK. Yeah, I did. We were watching the market yeah. move on the JK, and we had already started the conceptual stuff on the JK Habitat. And uh, we didn't have the bandwidth to have all these vehicles in the stable. So it's like, well, something's got to go. And I didn't advertise that, the Comanche for sale. Somebody approached me. Ah, gotcha. And uh, it was kind of an interesting story. The guy had two Comanches, and he was trying to make one Comanche out of the two Comanches of parts to build something like what I had. And I said, well, I'll sell you this one. How about that? And he's like, you're kidding. I said, no. And he said, oh, he says, uh, I'll say yes, but I have to talk it over with my wife. I said, okay. And he says, well, we usually like to sleep on something before we make a major decision. I said, okay, fine. They came back about three hours later. This was at an expo in Mormon <laughs> Lake. Came back about three, three hours later and said, well, we'll take it. I said, what'd you do? Take a nap? And he said, exactly. <laughs> took a nap. <laughs> <laughs> so that was awesome. And, and uh, they're they're still loving that truck, taking beautiful care of it. it. You know, it's one of those things that you have that much travel invested in that vehicle, and you have all these memories. So it almost takes on a life of its own and has a personality to it. And it was nice to know that it went to some, to a, a couple that were really going to enjoy it and, and use it for yeah. what it was built for. So, I mean, I guess one of the, one of the themes that we've kind of been touching on with the full-size stuff and – and with your Comanche is, you know, the gross vehicle weight and people building stuff that is just way too heavy. Mm-hmm. I mean, so w- how do people avoid that? Like, what, what's your advice that to help people build stuff lighter? 
my first piece of advice is make a list of everything that you take on a trip mm. and do that consistently. Your, your list will change based on terrain or season, right? After those trips, and this is, this is when you're starting out. After the end of each one of those trips, debrief that list. Go through it. Did I use this? Yes or no. If I didn't have this with me, would it have been inconvenient or would it have been life-threatening? Yeah. Some th Think about, for example, uh, first aid kit. You want to make sure that you have it. You don't want to use it, but if you didn't have it, it would be a problem. So yeah. that's always going to stay on the list. But that second corkscrew, maybe not. Yeah. Right? Could you have made coffee another way without... It's, it's, I feel it's just espresso so, maker. Yeah, it's Good. so easy to be over prepared. It, it, exactly, and so I think that pairing back of stuff is really critical. I learned that doing winter mountaineering, where you had to carry a lot of equipment, so you really had to think carefully about what other gear did you carry, and decide that you really shouldn't, because at that point, an ounce on your back was like a pound on your feet. Mm. You know, so you want to make sure that you have just what you need and when you only carry just what you need you are more likely to take better care of it and you're going to know exactly where it is so that's that, that's a critical thing to do and that's going to help you steer away from overloading your vehicle yeah you know, for sure with. yeah yeah i mean i know like i used to carry a lot of parts with me down to baja because i had this concern that i might not be able to get the parts so I would carry like an alternator, a water pump, and all these other things. And that stuff adds up. And this is before synthetic ropes. I used to carry 50 feet at 3 eighths chain. Sure. <laughs> you know, because that yeah. was the recovery thing. That was your winch line extension right yeah, there. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, and a Danforth yeah. anchor, right? An aluminum one, but still an anchor because the, the, the pull pile didn't exist. And burying your spare tire was a big pain in the butt. So totally. So I didn't want to do that. But in, in retrospect, I learned a lot from that and learned how to pare back my gear. Um, That's great advice. Yeah, I think if you, if you do any motorcycle travel. Great that, training. Yeah, and I don't mean like with, you know, the pannier packs and all that. No, just like basic. I mean, when I was traveling by motorcycle in, in, in Africa, I did it with a backpack. And that was it. So whatever my mountain gear was, it was never more than my mountain gear. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So that's where people should start. But there's that temptation to see what's out there and what's on Instagram and, oh, that looks cool, and it's what so you affectionately call Farkle. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of that that's completely unnecessary. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting to think of just the stuff that you're bringing with you. Mm -hmm. um, what, what about for people that, you know, like Scott's first Tacoma and my first car and a lot of everybody's first thing, you just you get this... You know, you, you try and bolt too much stuff on your car, right? And I don't know. It's it's a it's a hard thing to avoid. Well, I think I think it's an evolution. I, I think we learn things from those experiences, right, Scott? Yeah. We, we we started off and we thought we needed stuff, and then we realized, oh, maybe I can eliminate some things either through just having a new skill set, or realizing that there's an alternative way to do things. Mm -hmm. And that's how we learn how to pare back. And that's why resources like the Expedition Portal kind of help guide people in that direction. Although that amount of information can be overwhelming. Right? Sure. It's, it's like where to park in an empty parking lot. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, where do I go first? <laughs> Decision fatigue, yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and it, and it looks like because you've had so many different vehicles and now you've built so many different vehicles, is there is there some thread of consistency like if you were to give someone like the the first three to five things that they can should consider, like they buy a new Dodge Ram, twenty five hundred diesel off the lot. What's the first three to five things that you would recommend that they do for remote travel? Definitely tires, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go with a lift right away. I mean, if you were going say with a, a, a regular cab and uh, and the shorter frame. Um, those trucks will support 35-inch tires without a lift. And if you're going with an AEV lift, you're only gaining two inches anyway. Right? Yeah. So better tires, 
definitely get some recovery gear. Number one piece of recovery equipment is an air compressor, mm. period. Because if you are properly airing down, you're not getting stuck. You know, Much less thing. likely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and less risk of flats, et cetera. And, and if you do get it flat, that's probably the most common thing that's going to happen to you. Yeah. Um, what else? Maybe that's it. <laughs> Good set of tires and an air compressor and some tools and recovery kit. Well, Perfect. Yeah, it's just so easy to get caught up in the... You know, I'll say yeah. caught up in the Instagram of just like, I have to have this and this and this and this. Like, there's some Tacomas I see running around town, and I'm like, you must have 50 different items bolted to the exterior of your truck. Yeah. Why? Well, it, it, the first evolution of my Comanche was pretty much, I went from the motorcycle to the Comanche. And so what did I do in the Comanche? I threw a full-size shovel in. Um and well a good shovel is like super handy yeah it's kind of sure. a good shovel gets you out of it's kind of like a towel of in hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy mm. <laughs> there <laughs> there you was go. a towel in a bath- bathrobe right there you go. Uh, no i think a good shovel is important for for a lot of different reasons getting unstuck um human waste all of it human yeah. waste sure. fire control it's a decent weapon you know all those things um but um, I just threw my backpack in the back because I already had that gear. I already yeah. had a little stove, and I already had a sleeping bag and you know, a tarp and a tent. And sure. So you could go minimalist. And I, I've actually toyed with the idea of, yeah, maybe a samurai would be a fun truck again. It would be. Right. Oh, I, I dream of tin-top samurais. I know a nice like to, one. To find, to find like a a stalker tin top samurai would love that i, want, I, I want know one, one in town jimmy's. that's got a 1.9 vw diesel in it oh wow that's cool is it like next year that we can get jimneys yes that's 98 that's, uh right no even earlier than that it may be night yeah it could be 98 yeah, yeah it could be 98 yeah. maybe no maybe later than that maybe 2000 yeah 98 or 2000 something like that yeah. soon very soon yeah but i don't know for me like if i were just to say the two essential pieces of kit that don't necessarily have to stay in the vehicle can go with you anywhere swiss army knife and a golf umbrella golf umbrella there you go yeah you're really big on the umbrella thing heck yeah everybody who's ever done the epic overland trip you know going to central and south america for three years i've given them a golf umbrella (laughs) and they always inevitably somewhere throughout the trip send me an email (laughs) going oh you saved our bacon (laughs) because it's shade when you got to walk out when you're stuck or broken down or protection from the rain, who's changed a tire in a sloppy wind uh, rainstorm? Sure, right. It's nice yeah. to have a big umbrella. Yeah, it's uh, you can collect water with it. Um, you should have the man improvised spear. It. It's an improvised spear, and uh. it is certainly a gentleman's weapon if you're walking through a town. I mean, yeah. what's more suave and debonair than strutting with a long umbrella as you walk down the street? Yeah. But, you know, if somebody slips out of a dark alleyway and confronts you, you, you poke them in the face with it. There you go. Umbrella versus machete. Yeah. That would be an interesting. <laughs> it would be. I'd put money on that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got some of our standard questions, too. We'd love to, to get your insights on because I think it's going to be it's going to be really fun to hear. And this is one of my favorite questions. So mm-hmm. I'm going to ask this one. So what are some of your favorite books? What are some of the most formative volumes that you've enjoyed in your life? Um, that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, I think one of my favorite books is a book that was written by an Italian POW in Kenya, and it's called No Picnic on Mount Kenya. And I think at one point you guys even had it on your top 10 readers list some years back. Sure. And it's an account of Italian soldiers who were held in a POW camp. Uh, And this is autobiographical story, so it makes it very readable. Um, they were in a POW camp in Kenya, I think somewhere around Manyuki, near the, the foothills of Mount Kenya. And Mount Kenya is a beautiful mountain. It's 17,000 some feet. Um, and uh, they knew that if they escaped from camp, there was nowhere for a white man to go run and hide. Yeah. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you stand out. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Easy right? to find you. But uh, they were all reluctant, you know, Italian soldiers, and they... They, they came from, you know, near the Italian Alps. And, and one day, 
this cloud bank cleared and they saw this beautiful peak and there were some of them that had climbed in the Alps and they're, oh my God, that's so gorgeous. And they were bored out of their minds. And so they put together clandestinely gear, you know, made from blankets and, you know, nails and stuff and escaped from camp and climbed Mount Kenya and then came back to the camp. And uh, they were severely punished for it and all that, but the British were like pretty amused by the story at the same time, and they also didn't even believe it. And so the British actually sent out a party up the mountain to to verify that they had actually been there, and they found remnants of the things that they had left behind. So it's a beautiful story. It's really well written, and it's just a great adventure. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. And there's another book that comes out of, um, also out of the same area in, in in uh, East Africa, Kenya, Somalia area. And there was a guy named uh, Dan Eldon. And the book is called uh, The Journey. No, The Destination is the Journey. The Journey is the Destination, something like that. Before, it was a cliche thing to say. And uh, he only lived 23 years. He, he, he was born in London. He uh, grew up in Kenya. And he was a Reuters photojournalist. And... He died tragically. He was stoned to death in Somalia. Um, but he left a journal behind, and it was this series of photographs and collages and notes and things that uh, he had written uh, during that short life he had uh, in East Africa. And it kind of paralleled my East African experiences, albeit two decades later. And it was a book that my mother bought for me because she thought I would enjoy it. Mm. And it was it was published, I believe, by his mother. Wow. Because uh, she discovered his journals after wow. he had passed away. And it's a it's a beautiful book to thumb through. Wow. Yeah. I highly recommend that. And Great suggestions. Yeah. And then I have to say, this is like a, a, a little private pleasure of mine. Because I was in a French lycée, um, I ended up uh, kind of growing up in French, if you will, on the Asterix and Obelix uh, comic book series. And if you don't know that series, it's a story about a small village in Gaul that resisted the Roman Empire. And there are all these different adventures that happen around them beating up Romans all the time. And, and they were, the, they were the, the, the pebble in the Romans' shoe as they were trying to overrun Europe. And they could never defeat this little small village of, of the, the Gauls. And it's a great storyline. And Awesome. I still have those comic books. <laughs> and I cool. still pull them out. And, well, they tell history. So there's Cleopatra, Caesar, and all of these different periods in time. And it's, you know, it's history and wars and things that shape the world as it is that we know today. And so when you have some kind of understanding of how that's happened over a course of time, it gives you a better picture of why the world is. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So I still I still read those. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> what uh, what questions you got? So, so somebody walks into AT Overland, they're yeah. a brand new Overlander. Yeah. What's the most important piece of advice that you can give them? Get a golf umbrella. <laughs> other, other than that one. Oh, other than that? Ah. Don't sweat the, the small stuff. Get just get out there. I think I think there are people who overthink the process. Yeah. We were talking about that earlier. And I think what's more important than anything else is just instead of reading and watching other people's adventures. Get out there and have your own. And then figure out what it is that you need to enhance those adventures. We're happy to give you advice, and we want to know what your adventure expectations are so that we have a better chance of crafting what it is that you need. And, and if you don't need what we have or what we make, we're going to tell you. We're going to tell you, no, get out there in your, you know, your VW bug and travel a little bit. Yeah. Get yeah. stuck a few times, and then you'll know what you really need. Yeah. Um, 
So that's that's what would happen if you walk in at the door at AT. Because we really care. We're passionate about the, the lifestyle and the travel. Obviously, you know, we've all done it, and yeah. we, we love it. We want to make sure that people don't make mistakes. Yeah. You know, if, if you spend so much time sweating the details and pouring a bunch of money into something, well, geez, that, that, that could have been plane tickets. It could have been fuel. It could have been food. It could have been a visa. It could have been a bribe at a border. You know, yeah. You know, could have been just going. Just just get out there. Yeah. And that's what I did. Hot wire the neighbor's motorcycle. Let's go. Vamanos. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, crazy stories from Mario. As oh, usual. I, I love it. Mario, thank you so much for being on the podcast when people want to find out more about you mm-hmm. and adventure trailers, uh, how do they do that? Well, if they want to find out about AT, um, ATOverland.com, or you can find us at ATOverland on social media. Uh, if you want to find out about me, I'm, I'm on Instagram. That's the only place you're going to find non-Overlandy stuff about me. Uh, so Donovan Mario on Instagram. Cool. That's great. Any other questions come to mind for you, Matt? Lots, lots after the podcast is over. <laughs> Mainly about food. <laughs> <laughs> food, all right. We can go down that path. Well, Mario, again, thank you so much for all that you have done for this industry, for your passion for the Overland Traveler, and for making great equipment, and all of your support to me and our team throughout the years. It means so much, Mario, and we just really are grateful that we had you on the podcast today. Oh, well, thanks for having me, guys. It's Absolutely. A, it's a man. pleasure to be a part of this community. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, Let's go break some bread. That sounds good. <laughs> and we will talk to you next time. Yeah.